Silicone stent intubation is an especially useful technique in the treatment of infants with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction who have not responded to simple probing. Although the insertion of silicone stents is simple in principle, and a wide variety of instruments and modifications of technique have been devised, the actual experience can be quite difficult. Even experienced surgeons may encounter difficulty when attempting to retrieve the probe from the nose. This difficulty is largely due to the compact and relatively unfamiliar anatomy of the nasal passages in small children. In this videotape, we will illustrate a new technique for silicone intubation. Silicone intubation is routinely performed on an outpatient basis using our ambulatory surgery unit. While adults may have silicone stents placed under local anesthesia, we have found that general anesthesia is generally required for infants and small children. Bleeding from the nasal passages is not uncommon and endotracheal intubation greatly reduces the risk of aspiration. At times, the silicone intubation procedure is difficult and time consuming and the use of general anesthesia will allow the procedure to be performed in a deliberate and careful manner. The instruments required for silicone intubation are simple but proper selection is important. The fiber optic headlight is perhaps the most important instrument because it provides good illumination required for visualization during the intranasal portion of the procedure. A pediatric nasal speculum is needed for the inspection of the nasal passages and bayonet forceps are useful for placing the nasal packing. In addition to the usual punctal dilator and lacrimal probes, we may need a Crawford hook or a small muscle hook. For this demonstration, we will use the Rittling intubation set. This set consists of a hollow stainless steel probe approximately 0.8 millimeters in diameter. The probe is grooved on one side for the entire length of the probe. The silicone tubing is 1.2 millimeters in diameter and is bonded to a monofilament polypropylene suture. The polypropylene is modified so that it is much thinner in the mid portion of its length. This modification allows the thin portion of the suture to slip through the groove in the Rittling probe. Preoperative nasal packing with 4% cocaine solution is very helpful. Cocaine is an effective decongestant and therefore increases our working space within the nose. In addition, cocaine provides excellent vasoconstriction and greatly reduces the amount of nasal bleeding. Cocaine toxicity is a serious problem, especially in small children, and we must be careful not to exceed 3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. The anesthesiologist should be informed of the plan to use cocaine because some anesthetic agents increase myocardial susceptibility to cocaine toxicity, and these agents can be avoided. The cocaine solution is carefully measured with a syringe to avoid overdosage. The solution is used to moisten a cotton pledget, which will be inserted into the nose. Using a nasal speculum and bayonet forceps, the cotton pledget is placed beneath the inferior turbinate along the floor of the nose. The punctum is then widely dilated with a tapered punctal dilator to admit the tip of the Rittling probe. The probe is first inserted perpendicular to the eyelid margin and advanced into the ampulla of the canaliculus. The probe is then rotated parallel to the eyelid margin and advanced until a hard stop is encountered, indicating contact with the medial wall of the lacrimal sac in the bony lacrimal sac fossa. The probe is then rotated 90 degrees superiorly, directing the tip into the nasal lacrimal duct. The nasal packing is removed so that it will not be impaled by the probe. The probe is advanced down the nasal lacrimal duct and through the membranous obstruction. Care should be taken not to advance the probe too far since it may become embedded in the floor of the nose or even penetrate the palate. The groove of the Rittling probe is rotated medially. At this point, we confirm that the Rittling probe has entered the nasal cavity by placing a large Bowman probe beneath the inferior turbinate and demonstrating metal-on-metal -metal contact. The proximal end of this Rittling probe is modified with a funnel-shaped opening to facilitate the passage of the polypropylene suture. The polypropylene suture bonded to the silicone stent is threaded into the hollow Rittling stent and advanced into the nasal cavity. After several inches of suture have been threaded into the probe, the suture typically curls up and spontaneously emerges from the nares. Occasionally, the suture does not come out of the nares. Pulling the probe back about two millimeters, rotating the groove more anteriorly, and re-advancing the polypropylene facilitates spontaneous emergence from the nares. In addition, we have found that the polypropylene can be readily retrieved from the nasal cavity 
by sweeping under the inferior turbinate with a small muscle hook. The polypropylene suture is pulled through the system until the narrowed portion of the polypropylene is just above the distal end of the probe. The narrowed portion of the polypropylene can then be slipped out of the groove of the rippling probe after the probe is slowly removed from the nasolacrimal duct. A small amount of ophthalmic ointment is placed at the medial canthus to facilitate passage of the stent through the canaliculus and the nasolacrimal duct. The polypropylene suture is drawn from the nose, pulling the silicone stent after it. The same procedure is repeated, working through the superior canaliculus. The ends of the stents are joined in a single square knot. The diameter of a single square knot is not much greater than the diameter of the silicone tubing and can therefore be safely withdrawn through the canaliculus without causing injury. This greatly facilitates removal of the stents at a later date. After the silicone tubing has been tied, the knot is allowed to retract into the nose. Using a 4-0 chromic suture on a small half-circle needle, the stent is sutured to the lateral nasal mucosa. The chromic suture helps to maintain the position of the stent and is reabsorbed within a few weeks, thus not interfering with later stent removal. The tubing is then cut just inside the external nares. It is important that the tubing not be cut too short since it could retract into the nasolacrimal canal. The tails of the silicone stent should be left long enough to hang down inside the nose, maintaining a patent fistula at the intranasal ostium of the nasolacrimal duct. The operation is now complete. The eye is inspected and the silicone stent is seen to be in good position with no tension on the puncta. The patient is awakened and returned to the recovery room. The patient is examined prior to discharge and given a follow-up appointment for one week. The family is instructed to call if there are any signs of infection or irritation. The stents are usually removed after three months if the child remains free of tearing. Silicone stents are usually well tolerated and cause the child no discomfort. Perhaps the most common complication of silicone stents is lateral displacement of the silicone loop. This may occur when the child rubs their eye inadvertently catching the tubing at the medial canthus. In most cases the stent can simply be removed. Stent removal is accomplished by immobilizing the child grasping the stent at the medial canthus with a hemostat and withdrawing the stent slightly. The tubing is then cut with scissors and the stent removed without pain or injury to the canaliculi. We have used this new technique of silicone intubation for approximately one year. Retrieval of the polypropylene suture from the nose is easier than retrieval of traditional metallic probes. This technique has been performed with success by relatively inexperienced residents. Nasal bleeding and mucosal trauma are encountered less frequently, and infracture of the inferior turbinate has rarely been necessary. We have occasionally been unable to retrieve the rippling stent from the nose. It may rarely be necessary to convert to another method of intubation. We encourage you to try this new technique of silicone intubation.